I want to start by telling a story, and then I'm going to be sitting in front of that computer so that I can advance the slides. And then one of the people who attended, who participated in my tour this past January, Martin Luther King's birthday weekend, is going to share a little bit of her experience. And then we're going to have uh, questions, perhaps we'll have answers. But um, I just want to give you a sense of how the, the, the talk is going to flow. And um, it's right now, Apple says it's 1218. My Apple Watch, I just call it Apple. Apple says it's 1218. So it's possible that we would be here for an hour, which would put us at uh, 118. Is that OK with you? And if it's not OK, can you make it so that you can just find your way out um, and not feel bad? You don't have to, don't worry, I understand that everyone has schedules and places to go. And I really appreciate your patience and the way that we've been in it, interacting with each other in a place where there's not necessarily a chair for you to sit on. So um, thank you, everybody, for bringing, bringing the love. Um, I just came back. Uh, two, two days ago from Selma and Montgomery, Alabama, and um, I was with one of my team members, who I hope you'll see one, her, the picture of her in my slideshow, and she played a recording from uh, Dr. King, um, a woman who was in the church, in the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, one of the congregants, and she was a younger member of the church. And of course, she really looked up to Dr. King, and she took his words to heart. And what she conveyed was he told all of these young freedom fighters that there were two, two postures, there were two rules that they, they needed to find a relationship with, a lifetime relationship with. The first was that you have to forgive everybody for everything they ever did. Right? You have to forgive everybody for everything they ever did. That is not an overnight accomplishment. That's not an accomplishment. That's a moment-to-moment desire. And the second thing that Dr. King told this young congregant is um, you have to lose your fear of death. So in order to be of service, to truly be where God wants you to be, you cannot be in judgment. You can't have hate in your heart. And you can't be concerned about me, 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 me. And I'm saying this not for you. I'm saying this because this is my work. My work is to continually, whenever I start feeling um, uh, nervous, anxious, judgmental, fearful, there are, and there seem to be more and more reasons in our political climate in our environmental climate. There seem to be more and more reasons to feel fearful and judgmental. And I'm not here to judge. I am here, as Dr. King advised that congregant, to forgive everyone for everything they've ever done. And I want to also just say about the fear of death, on some level, speaking in front of people, many people think of that as scarier than death. And while I do speak in front of people often, I anticipate that at several points during this time, I am going to die. I am going to um, say something that I wish I hadn't, or I am going to um, become someone else. I am going to die. And that's actually not a bad thing. It's a good thing to know up front. Everybody dies. So, I'm, I'm, setting the, I'm setting the bar high. 
I'm, I'm telling you where I'm coming from, and I'm saying it because I can feel that that's where we're all coming from. We would not be coming to a talk like this unless we want to be something bigger. We're ready to hear the call, the call that I heard we all want to hear. Um, and before I sit down, I'm just going to share a story that is the foundation of what got me to Montgomery, Alabama. Um, I fell in love with Dr. King's dream. I fell in love with his, um, his unwavering vision um, to the point where every day I would go into my laundry room and I would cry for hours looking at photos and it was almost as if Dr. King took me under his wing and said, we've got some healing to do. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go here and I want you to go there and I want you to listen to this and I want you to say this to that person. And I cried every day, more in those four months than I had cried in over 50 years of life because Dr. King was right next to me. And one of the stories that he kept pointing me to is a story called The Acres of Diamonds. And the Acres of Diamonds story can be found in almost every wisdom tradition. In fact, um, uh, the Wizard of Oz is somewhat of an Acres of Diamonds story. It's a story in which what you've been seeking has been there all along. Now, how many of us have had that in our life, an Acres of Diamonds, where what we were seeking, right? Raise your hand. What you were seeking wasn't out there somewhere, it was right here. And as I followed Dr. King's, um, his coaching, Dr. King advised me, go, go to my place, I will take care of you. Go to Montgomery, I will, I'll meet you there. And what I found when I went to Montgomery was the acres of diamonds. It was a place where all of the potential, all of the vision that the framers of the Constitution embedded into that document, all of the tears and the toil and the, the difficulties that all of our ancestors have endured in order to make this democracy what it is, I found it there. I found it in the people. I found it in the black people. I found it in their stories. I found it in the food they made for me. I found it in the way they talked to me in the cab when they picked me up at the airport. I found it in the art that they made. I found it everywhere in black people. And it was my acres of diamonds. I had been looking everywhere. Where is the truth? of the United States of America. Where, is the, where are the people who are holding the energy that will make this what it could be? And I found it. So we all have something that we're seeking. And perhaps Montgomery is your acres of diamonds. But what I want to share with you are the people I met the stories they told, the gifts they gave, and the healing that I received. So I'm going to just park myself over here, and um, hopefully you'll be able to see this screen. Um, and I will also be narrating a bit. So let's see, it's 12.26. OK. You know what? Uh, what I forgot to mention early, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, I imagine there may be some questions. Um, Freedom asks that maybe you hold your questions to the end, and just so that everyone in the room can hear, if you do have a question, um, please just come up here and use the microphone so we can all hear at the end. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, so can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, so this is uh, my dear friend, our dear friend, Dr. Martin Luther King, who moved to Montgomery, Alabama in the 50s, stayed there for six years, and during that six years that he was in Montgomery, uh, he led the um, organization 
that conducted a bus boycott. And that's something that most everybody who grows up in this country has heard about. This gentleman is named Brian Stevenson. And Brian Stevenson was a young lawyer who became uh, committed to the plight of the poor and those who uh, did not have adequate representation because they simply couldn't afford it. And he, one of his sayings is that you're better off being wealthy and guilty than you are being poor and innocent. So he created a not-profit uh, organization called the Equal Justice Initiative. And their purpose is to represent and to bring forward the inequities that our country um, currently has in the uh, judicial system and in the prison system. And we, were, we will be looking at um, a couple of sites that the Equal Justice Initiative created, the Legacy Museum and the Peace and Justice Memorial, which is also called the Lynching Memorial. Um, I just want to say one other thing that he said that stays with me is that we cannot recover from our history until we deal with it. And I'm grateful that we're all here because this is how we deal with it. This is how it looks. So I think that's powerful and important. This gentleman is um, Chap, and he's part of the team in Montgomery that um, when I bring people there, he's part of the, the team that you meet. Um, he was the first black prison chaplain appointed by um, then Governor George Wallace. And I put his picture immediately after Brian Stevenson's because, um, and I'm basically going to take you on a virtual tour with that we went on in January. I'm just going to walk you through what we did. The first night, we saw the movie Just Mercy, which is the movie that chronicles the life of Brian Stevenson. And I wanted us to see that movie the first night because the next morning we were going to be meeting this gentleman whose name is Chap Browder. And Chap was the prison chaplain for the, the people in the movie who were on death row. So we were going to meet someone who had direct relationships with people that we had just seen in a movie the night before. And Chap's story itself, it, again, it's, it's the Acres of Diamonds. Um, Chap grew up in segregated, the segregated South, and at a certain point he told his mother, I have to leave here because he was getting beaten by the police with such regularity for no apparent reason that he said, I'm going to kill someone if I don't leave here. So he left and he basically said, I'll never come back. Well, you know, as they say, the rest is history. He did come back. Um, and there's so much more to that story, but um, he is such a dedicated servant of the community, of the many communities, but specifically men who have been recently released from incarceration and he created a therapeutic horse farm so that these people who society does not want in their midst have a place to go to make that transition from prison to um, back into society. Now this woman who's uh, we can see with the, the red glasses on her sweatshirt is Chaplain Browder's daughter, Michelle, and again, a huge part of my Montgomery team. Um, and Michelle is, is conducting a tour right there, and that sign that she's pointing to is one of three signs that the Equal Justice Initiative was allowed to um, put up in Montgomery. They wanted to put up 
a whole lot more than three signs, but they were told they could only put up three signs. So um, that's one of the three signs that they put up. Um, I'm not going to read that. There, uh, I'm going to just skip over some things. Um, when we first start your tour, we take you down to the riverfront. And the riverfront is significant. And this, this is one of the signs at the riverfront. The riverfront in Montgomery is significant because that was the entry point for the slave trade. So our transatlantic slave trade ended in the early 1800s, but what happened after that was the domestic slave trade grew and grew. And uh, enslaved people were moved from the north down to the south. And Montgomery, Alabama became one of the largest slave, domestic slave ports in the south. And um, in the back of that, in the background of that slide is a train. And the train is significant because taking people by boat down the Alabama River was not nearly as expedient as bringing enslaved people into Montgomery by train. And when they started getting the train, Montgomery became this enormous hub of, of enslaved people being sold. So um, when we are down at the riverfront, we come up through this tunnel. As you can see, underneath that sign, there's a tunnel. And enslaved people were brought through that tunnel. And much like in Africa, there is a point of no return. So you, you exit a train or a boat, and you're children and your husband or wife or father or mother are separated from you and you're led through this tunnel and when you come out the other side of the tunnel what what the Montgomery residents had was called a jubilee and a jubilee is when everybody in town knows that the enslaved people are getting off these trains and they're gonna go find their next nursemaid or the next people are going to be working the fields or the next person who's going to be um, working in their house. It was a big deal. You got your kids out of school. And the, the enslaved people walked up Commerce Street being ogled and humiliated and taunted until they reached either a slave warehouse, which there were many, um, in Montgomery, right on Commerce Street, or the slave auction block. Um, so this is a group of people going through that tunnel. This is the back of the tunnel. And as um, pretty as this might look, this is actually the site of the slave auction block. So uh, when before Montgomery was quote-unquote settled by people from Europe. It was, you know, the land of indigenous people. And this fountain is actually an artesian well. It's the site of a well. So an artesian well is a formation of rock and water. And people gathered at this water site to get water and, and to be community and all that stuff. So it was always a gathering place. Then after the uh, indigenous people, all their land was what, what they call seeded, which means their land was stolen. After their land was stolen, uh, this continued to be a center of um, community gathering but it also began to be a center of commerce where things were bought and sold. And the things that were bought and sold <coughs> included human beings. Um, and I don't know about anyone else, but have you been somewhere and looked at something and you could, you could feel the disconnect? Like, I'm looking at, you know, 
a, a beautiful house, but I can tell that something yucky happened at that house. Has anyone else had that, like, you're looking at something, you're like, I know there's more to this story. And this, um, as, as beautiful as this is, I was so attracted to the energy of this spot because it was so powerful. And I will explain why. I call this ground zero of our, um, the, the history of race in the United States. This particular spot is ground zero. It's, it's a powerful vortex. Let's see, I'm gonna just go forward. Let me see if I can find, okay. Here's why I call it ground zero. So in the foreground of this photo is our dear friend Rosa Parks. As everyone knows, the story of Rosa Parks, um, she was a seamstress and she was a secretary for the NAACP. She worked at a store which if, if she were turned around and she walked 15 yards up the street, the store where she was working would be on her left hand side. So she was leaving work and she was approaching this and that's where she got on the bus she got on the bus for that fateful ride that day adjacent to the auction block and then that building that you see across the street is the building from which the telegraph was sent to take fort sumter so for those of you who are uh, civil war aficionados we know that take fort sumter was the first act of the Civil War. Jefferson Davis actually, I don't know if I have a slide of the first um, Confederate White House, but the first Confederate White House is in Montgomery, Alabama. It was four months, the first Confederate White House, until they relocated to Virginia. But Jeff Davis, as we call him in Montgomery, we call him Jeff Davis. Jeff Davis issued that command and it was sent from that building and so when I was there, and I didn't like quote unquote know this, but I knew it. I could feel this is a big deal. What, what happened here is a big deal. Um, and wait, I want to show you one other angle. Oh, this is a Barbie doll of Rosa Parks. Yeah, she's, she's, um, she's a celeb. This is a picture I took with another person that was on a tour I was on where we were comparing the features of Rosa Parks as interpreted by a white sculptor with the features of Rosa Parks as she actually looked. Because a lot of things that we see have been altered. We, we don't always get the whole story. That's why it's so powerful to talk to the people. Because the people, a lot of them were there and they know what happened okay so i i don't have the um the other picture that i want to show you but um if you were at this this fountain oh this is it okay so way off in the distance all the way at the back of that photo you'll see a dome that dome is the capital of montgomery is the capital of alabama that dome is the state capitol building and it was on the steps, actually it wasn't on the steps because they did not allow Negroes on the steps of that building to give a talk. Dr. King ended the five day march for voting rights at that Capitol building. And he gave a speech in which he said, how long, not long. But that he was not allowed to stand on the steps to give that speech. And as I stood at that auction block, well fountain and i looked up the street at that building and up the street on the right hand side is also where the dexter avenue baptist church is located it's this tiny red i think it's my next slide it's this tiny red church in a midst a sea of enormous white facades like the 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 capitol buildings are enormous and they have huge columns and they're very they're, everything is white, white, white. And then there is this little, curious little church that kind of sits at the feet of this huge, uh, you know, very intense looking building. And this 
was the church from which many of the plans that took shape as the bus boycott were laid and uh, carried out. So as I stood at that artesian well on the last day of, of our tour in January, I received this download that the day of going to the steps of the Capitol to try to ask for them to change their mind is over. We are no longer going to go beg for somebody to, to help. That the, the day is coming when all of that facade of power is going to come rolling down that hill, the mighty stream is going to come rolling down that hill and it's going to rest at the feet of the people, the people who've been on auction blocks, the people who have not been heard or seen. That's the direction we're heading and that it just, Montgomery for me is a place that speaks and tells you things that you just don't hear other places. It's, there's no denying the intense activities that have taken place in that city and therefore it, it just comes right into your heart and you can hear it and you can see it. This is the inside of Dr. King's church and although they don't, you have to take a tour to go in there, you can go to church there on Sunday. This is Dr. King's house. This was uh, the parsonage house that went with the church. Let's see how we're doing for time. Um, and I want to just tell a quick story about this house and what happened here. Um, just catch up this. Okay. So on the porch of this house, if you walked up those steps and you looked to your right, you would see um, a little indentation on the porch and that's where a bomb was thrown and, and went off and three days before that happened dr king had a um like a seminal life-changing moment and it was one of those moments where he that's probably where he got that advice you have to lose your fear of death so what happened was he was deep in this bus boycott stuff and the people of Montgomery thought that the blacks were just going to give up and they didn't give up. It was 381 days of walking and they did not give up. And so Dr. King and Coretta Scott King were getting phone calls at their house. Now this was before answering machines and being able to see who's calling you picked up the phone because you never knew if it was somebody you knew or it was important and they were getting death threats they were getting people were saying just horrible horrible things and he said they were getting up to like 40 calls a day and one night he got home from a meeting he was tired he got in bed the phone rang he answered it they said you better get out of here you're going to be so sorry you ever came here we're going to you're done and he said he hung up the phone and he just, he couldn't sleep. It was, he had reached this place where he couldn't take it, he, he couldn't take it anymore. And he started thinking like, okay, what do I say to the people at the church and in the Montgomery Improvement Association, which was the organization that was the bus boycott organization, he was like, how do I get out of this without like having the movement collapse? because I'm obviously not the guy. I'm not the, I'm, I'm, ter I'm not the guy. So he's sitting there in his house saying, I'm not the guy. He goes to his kitchen, and I hope everybody gets to go to that house, because they'll take you to that kitchen. They'll show you the table where he sat, where this incredible event occurred. And they'll, in fact, they'll play you a tape of his voice telling you the story. So he goes to his kitchen and he makes some coffee and he's sitting there, with this coffee just like, okay, now what do I do? And he basically got, he heard a voice. And the voice said, you have to fight for righteousness. You are, you're not doing the wrong thing. This is the right thing to do. It didn't say the time is always right to do what's right, but 
That's what Dr. King says. The time is always right to do what's right. This voice just came in and just reassured him. And he said he immediately, the fear left him immediately. And three days later, a bomb was set off on his front porch and his wife, Coretta Scott King, their first child, and another woman from the, from the church who had been staying with Coretta Scott King while her husband was at the meeting, when they heard the sound on the front, they all ran to the back. And so nobody was harmed. But basically, I love that story for a couple of reasons. One is that we never hear that Dr. King was ever afraid or didn't think he was the one or had doubts. Or I love that story because we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be without fear. We don't have to be without blemishes and flaws and all that stuff in order to do what, something really meaningful. We don't have to. And I also love that story because we've all had midnight sitting at the table, the coffee's cold, how am I going to handle this? We've all been in those moments. And I, I just love that somebody I think so much of as Dr. King shares that story and it's, he said from that moment on, I never, I, I didn't fear anyone. I, I, my fear was gone. Just love that story. Um, this, is, this is his barber chair. This is where he got his hair cut. Um, and it's right down the street. And I just, there's another person who has his barber shop now. Just love that. These are a close up of the steps of the state capitol uh, where Dr. King was not allowed to speak, but he, they got a platform and he could speak in front of it. Um, this is an uh, artwork. You know, I don't think I have time to get into it. This is a group of us redoing Abbey Road in front of this. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, you got to have fun. This is the Confederate White House. Um, and I'm just going to take you really quickly through the Legacy Museum and the Peace and Justice Memorial just so that you can have a sense of the aesthetic. Uh, so the Equal Justice Initiative created um, sacred spaces. And one of the people who was at the opening of these sacred spaces, they opened in April of 2018. Set, and this person was a um, infectious disease doctor. And nobody could quite figure out, like, why would they have an infectious disease doctor, like, on the podium giving a speech at this, at the opening of these museums? And what he said was, as an infectious disease doctor, I know that it's not, my first protocol is not to treat the infection. My first protocol is to drain the infection. And he said, these museums are sacred spaces where we can begin to drain the, the karma, what we've all been carrying. These are spaces where we can see and be healed. So beautiful um, art and just incredibly um, thoughtful monuments. So these are steel uh, beams that have the names of those who were lynched from each of the counties in which they were lynched. And there are approximately 400 of those, and there are 4,000 documented lynchings. And the lynchings that he documented in this grouping took place between, um, I think it was like the early 1900s and the 1950s. Um, so I walked around looking for the lynchings that happened in the county where I was born in Beaufort, South Carolina, and indeed there is a Beaufort County uh, lynching. And these are replicas of the standing blocks that they're inviting each of the counties to take back to the states, to the counties where these lynchings occurred, so that we have monuments, so that we have ways in which we can acknowledge this history of terror that has affected everyone. And um, I'm going to just take us really quickly to the um, Legacy Museum. And when you enter the Legacy Museum, this is one of the first things you see. It says you're standing on a site where enslaved people were warehoused. 
And I would be taking you very close again now to Commerce Street and the, um, the auction block. We're in, right in that same neighborhood. Um, and I'll just scroll you through. You, you, can, you can't take photos inside of this museum, so I asked Equal Justice Initiative if they would let me use some of their photos, and that's why we can see these. They collected dirt from each of the sites where the lynchings occurred, and um, it's a way of commemorating and a way of honoring the voices of those that have not been heard, the, the voices of those that were silenced. It's powerful stuff. This is... Um, you know, you need to like take a nap. And in fact, I noticed it because I've gone several times now. When you come to Montgomery, you enter a vibration that's heavy. It's heavy. People go into somewhat of a coma. Like I, I see it. They have to like power down and shut down in order to match the vibration of that place. It's, it's powerful and heavy. This is just another example. This um, is a statue called Doubt. It's a black man holding an American flag. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous artwork. So I'm just gonna finish up real quick. This is the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I was just there three days ago. The day after I was there, all the politicians came, uh, walked over the bridge. It's the 55th anniversary of the um, Voter Rights March, which was the march that concluded in the signing of um, the greatest, uh, legislation ever for voting in the United States. Um, I'm going to skip over that. I love, I'd love to tell you that story, but I can't get into it. This is another wonderful gentleman who's part of our team. Um, his name is Jake Williams. He is one of 17 children, a son of sharecroppers, and the stories that he has to tell about that. He, in fact, marched with Dr. King. He and his sister ditched school the second to last day of the march. And they ran over to the march and they marched one of the legs of the march with Dr. King. Uh, this is a museum. Um, and I, I just want to actually give you guys a little information about this. OK, hold on. This right here. And it might be a little hard to see. Um, and then I'm going to ask my, my friend Polly to share anything she'd like to. So to me, this is one of the most powerful stories uh, that I discovered. This is part of my Acres of Diamonds. Um, those black, black hands, those are hands. Those are sharecroppers' hands. And what they're doing is they're filling out voters' ballots. And sharecroppers, most of whom couldn't read or write, couldn't decipher who to vote for. So they were given, like in Lowndes County, which is where this photo is taken, Lowndes County, once voting was allowed, once they were finally allowed to vote, they created the Lowndes County Freedom Organization and they had their own slate of candidates because at that time, the Democrat Party, there were no parties that welcomed this group of people. So they created a, an emblem for the Lowndes County Freedom Organization and one of the people in Lowndes County looked it up and saw that panthers, black panthers, are very nice until they're backed into a corner. And when you back a panther into a corner, you won't like what it does. So they said that would be a great symbol. So what they did was, wherever one of their candidates was on a ballot, they would put the symbol of the black panther. And so these people have ballots with black panthers on them, and Huey Newton came from California to help, to help register people to vote. And he saw that Black Panther symbol and he asked, could I, could I use that Black Panther symbol? And he took it back to California and that's how the Black Panther Party got the symbol of the Black Panther Party. Just something, you know, who knew? Um, and then I'll just end with, this is uh, President Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama, Sasha Malia, uh, First Lady Obama's mom. Um, in the wheelchairs are some of the most revered members of the civil rights movement 
in that area. John Lewis is holding hands with President Obama. So this is one of those uh, big celebrations of the, the voter rights march. Um, <clears throat> okay, and I really appreciate you all listening so attentively. And where's my beloved? Polly, would you share something? And yeah, come on up to the mic. Can you hear? Oh, yeah. Can you hear okay? Can you hear me? Test? There we go. Hi, I'm Polly Simpkins, and I recently went on this trip with, uh, with Freedom. And there's so much to say, and as you can see, uh, Freedom is part historian, and I believe part prophet. I think the work she is doing is so important. Going down to Montgomery was scary for me. I wanted to explore my personal relationship to race, but I also wanted to educate myself about the history surrounding race. And Freedom was able to do that for us and a really safe space. I went down, didn't know a soul that was on the trip. There were, I believe, eight other women uh, from different parts of the country. And it was um, an experience of a lifetime, truly. And. I wanted to mention one thing that uh, Freedom touched on, but um, we learned so much about history and the places that we went to, she showed you, and, and there were so many more than you could even talk about here. But what we also saw and experienced were, the, as she also mentioned, were the people of Montgomery and how they brought us into the fold everywhere we went, and Freedom created this wonderful way of connecting with, like Chap, the chaplain, and visiting his farm, and really being in touch with the experience of the people of Montgomery and Brian Stevenson. I didn't even know about Brian Stevenson until we went to the lynching memorial and heard about the work he was doing with the Equal Justice Initiative and seeing the movie Just Mercy. So I know we're running out of time, but I just wanted to say if you have an opportunity to go down to Montgomery with Freedom or on your own, just get there and see what's going on there. And if anyone has any questions, Freedom has my information, please contact me if you're at all interested and want to know a little bit more about the personal nature of this trip. It's a really uh, life-changing and such an important one for everybody to experience. So, uh, sure. Thank you. Um, so, we have a few minutes, and I would love very much if you have a question or a blessing or um, something you'd like to share that you come up and hold the mic so everyone can hear you. So if anyone would like to, to say, come on up, come on. And I'll stand right, I'll stand right next to you in case you have a question. My name is Nancy Steinbach and in, 19, hold it right up close. in 1960, my family moved to Fort Smith, Arkansas. My father was a Jew, a non-practicing Jew, but nonetheless a Jew. And he believed in equal rights. And my brother was five and a half years old, and he picked up the telephone. And this guy said, I'm going to kill your Jew bastard father. And it was because my father believed that African Americans and women should have the right to have the same jobs that all of the white men did in industry. The story goes on. I was in high school, and I was finally, I don't remember even how it happened, a member of a council, a student council, that went to a conference in West Memphis, Tennessee. And the only person that was in the group was an African-American student from, Fort, uh, from Van Buren, Arkansas. He made a speech. I'm a speech language pathologist. It was my first experience thinking about bi-dialectalism because he had to really work on not speaking dialectally. That night, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot, and we were in Memphis. And this child was so terrified. He was just pale and shaking. And I remember the white vice principal put his arm around him, and he said, we are here and you're safe. And so thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share?
I, yes. Yeah, you, you should have, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, tell me your name again, please. Nancy was just saying that um, there's a lot of wonderful information about Brian Stevenson, his story, and his work. And there's a particular story about a woman who was asked to collect dirt at one of the sites where someone was lynched. And while she was collecting the dirt, she noticed a white man who kept going back and forth in the street and she became frightened. And eventually that man came over to where she was and they started talking and he helped her to collect the dirt. And I, I would just want to say that that story is the Acres of Diamonds because what I see, like the fear and the shame that I carry, that my parents carry, that my parents' parents carry, it's in the body, it's in the nervous system, and it's a fear and shame around um, being black. It's a fear and shame around um, not being able to protect your family. It's a fear and shame around not being good enough. And what I'm discovering and enjoying so much is that the way that that fear and shame gets healed is not by um, secluding myself but it's by joining, joining with white people, joining with black people, joining with indigenous people, and sharing my story and coming to find out it's not just me. It's not just me. And there's something very healing that happens that I've seen in Montgomery when a black person shares their story and a white person receives it, just really receives it. A, a complete, it's like a complete protein. It's like a link in a chain has finally been closed. The acres of diamonds are all of the voices that we just never have heard. They're not just black voices, but that's what I'm talking about today. There are voices that were silenced, whether by lynching or by being torn away from your family. And when somebody gets to share a story like our friend Jake, the son of, you know, one of 17 children of a sharecropper whose family, uh, the, the land that they were sharecropping was owned by somebody who said to Jake's dad, when, when Jake's sister gets to a certain age, she's mine, I'm taking her. And Jake's dad left Lowndes County and went to Ohio and worked in an automobile plant until he had enough money to pay back this landowner so that he could protect his family. I mean, those stories, you know, and there's Jake. He's, it's not, he, this isn't a dead guy. This is, this is a person that we can talk to. That when, when we get to receive a story that that person gets to tell us and we get to really honor it, something in him is healed. Something in us is healed because we know that there are things that we just don't know. And when we go to somewhere like Montgomery, we, get to, we start to get the inkling. We start to get that sense of, okay, here's, I'm getting closer and closer to the reality, to the truth. That's why I call it ground zero. It's so close that my heart and your heart are, you know, we're both feeling the same thing. So um, if we don't have any other, okay, please, you know, shut me up. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk too much. But thank you, Patty. I want to look at you. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you. Um, ben and I went, uh, took uh, teams to Habitat to build houses for Habitat for Humanity in Mississippi in the Delta for 15 years. And um, the Memphis Civil Rights Museum had the same effect on me. But what I want to thank you for is the opportunity to hear and for you to share your heart with us and I think I, as a white woman, have much to be ashamed of. 
Um, and so the shame and guilt is a two-way street, but I think much more from our perspective to yours. But I agree completely that the sharing of our stories and our feelings will heal us both. And I'm eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Who else would like to share? OK. So Roberta and then my friend over here. And just so that you know, Apple says it's 108. <laughs> so just briefly, um, I was sharing with Freedom yesterday a book that I just read that I found very helpful as a white person um, who thinks they know some stuff. Um, it's called White Fragility, uh, Robin DiAngelo, which is just a wonderful, wonderful book to give perspective um, and understanding about I mean, just helping us to create some awareness. We might think we are um, evolved, <laughs> but we're steeped in so much white culture, and we really have to wake up, and we need as much help as we can get. So thank you for this, and thanks to other people who are helping us. So. Thank you, Roberta. Yeah. Thank you, Roberta. Kimberly, I want to say thank you for all the work that you're doing and sharing with us here in our community on Martha's Vineyard. I just wanted to let you know that on my father's side, he came from a family, brothers and sisters, of 14, three sets of twins, and he was born in Sealy, Alabama. So my great-great-grandfather happens to be one of these people who were lynched on my father's side. I had to share that with you. But most important for today, I want to share with you this, the Friends of Life. And Sandy Pementhal is one of the founders of this group, and she's going to share with you at this time. Thank you. Just for one second, and I also want to thank you so much for this. It's really beautiful. Um, I can sense in this room an energy that is just really special. And Friends for Life is a group that was started about a year and a half ago. There were five of us. I'm sure you know some of the people. Bob Tankard, Walter Collier, Rex Gerald, Ruth Major, myself, June Manning. And we've really been trying to look at how we can capture the energy of this island, the energy in this room. And I, I can't go into it uh, in total right now. But I did want to make everybody aware that this coming summer, we want to celebrate our diversity in, and celebrate each other and take the positive energy that we have and, and celebrate each other and just create the, uh, an island that, that is special and, and that will serve as an example. So I just tell you, there will be a calendar, there'll be events. We, we, uh, we, the playhouse will be involved, the police, the schools, just a vast variety. All of us need to be part of this celebration. And I think that the key to this is for us to know each other and be connected to each other in meaningful ways. And if we can accomplish that together, um, I think it will even enhance some of the things that you've talked about today. So. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me? I, I'm not getting into that, honestly. I have to just stay with what I'm here to do. Thank you, though. Um, all right. Does anyone else want to share anything? Good? All right, well, um, where can we go? I, um, I gave Anna some um, posters and buttons that I collected when I was in uh, Selma over the weekend, and I would love for you to feel free to take any of those that you would like. Um, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, yeah, Anna will help to pass those out. 
If you have um, any questions, you can um, put your name on a list, an email list, and um, I will, you know, you can send me an email, or, uh, sorry, I'll add you to my email list, and if you want any information, you can go to my website. So um, you can, we can stay in touch that way. And it's freedomrailtours.com is my website. All right. So maybe I, I do want to sing. I think we should sing. I do. It's funny, when, um, when we go to Montgomery this past weekend, we sang a couple of times. We sang when we were coming through the tunnels where the slaves, enslaved people, were let off the trains and the boats. And we sang the song, Wading in the Water. And we're gonna sing a little bit of that, and then we're just gonna sing This Little Light of Mine. All right? No, I just wanna say, what is wading in the water? What's that about? Wading in the water, and God's gonna trouble the water, is a reference to um, when trouble comes, when there's a big storm, if you watch a herd of buffalo and there's a big storm on the plain, the buffalo run into the storm because they know that if they run into the storm, they're going to run through the storm quicker than if they tried to avoid the storm by running away from it. And wade in the water is the water's going to be troubled. That's why we're going in it. We're not avoiding the water. The reason we're going in the water is because God's troubling the water. And when God troubles the water, that's when we become activated and we start to, we start to grow. That's what wade in the water is. So we'll do that, a couple rounds of that. First we'll say wade in the water, God's gonna trouble the water. And then wade in the water, I'm going to trouble the water. Because we, all of us in this room, showed up because we have a call. We're all here to trouble the water, to look directly at the things that, we're, that we've been told, don't look there, don't talk to them, don't, don't ask that. We've all felt it's time. It's time for us to be full-grown members of a democracy. So here we go. <laughs> Waiting in the water Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait. In the water, I'm going to trouble the water. We're going to do that one more time, and this time we're going to say earth. Earth's going to trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait. In the water, the earth's gonna trouble the water. All right. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. It's okay to clap. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine all around the world. All around the world. I'm gonna let it shine, oh, all around the world. I'm gonna let it shine all around the world. 
I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine in my family. In my family, I'm gonna let it shine. In my family, I'm gonna let it shine. In my family, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Okay, last one, this, this little light of mine. This little light of mine. Everybody stand up. I'm gonna let it shine. Come on. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.